Welcome everyone. I'm Matthew Gibney um, and this is the first of our Refugee Studies Centre uh, weekly seminars in forced migration for the new uh, 21, uh, 2021 academic year. Um, this seminar series, which is going to uh, run this term and then be replaced by a new one next term, is convened by myself and uh, Professor Tom Scott Smith. Uh, we have a, a new format uh, given to us partly by COVID, which is an online format. Uh, the uh, seminars will be one hour in duration uh, with the speaker speaking for about half an hour to 40 minutes. Then we'll have 20 minutes for questions. If you want to um, ask questions, you have to submit them through the Q&A button uh, which should be on the bottom of your screen uh, as part of the Zoom facility. Um, and just type in a question and um, I will pass it on to the speaker uh, subject to the constraints of time, of course. Um, and this, these new one hour uh, presentations, I think will make our uh, seminar series shorter, uh, certainly, but also punchier. And we have some great uh, speakers this term um, handpicked by Tom and myself. Um, and we're going to start off with uh, someone who, whose work I find very, very impressive tonight. And that's uh, Rutger Burney, who has just finished his uh, PhD at the, Europe at the European University Institute in Florence. I, fit, I first met Rutger when I examined his thesis last year in pre-COVID days, which was on the ethics and politics of deportation in Europe. And it was a really um, excellent piece of work. And I know that now he's working uh, on turning it into a book. And I think it'll be a very, very successful um, and influential monograph when it does come out. Um, he's been also conducting work on the ethics of um, short-term uh, movements of uh, migrants and um, uh, and his topic for tonight is uh, one that relates in many ways to, um, to the topic of his thesis, though taking out um, uh, a, uh, or going off on a particular tangent with it, and it's deporting extremists, a qualified defence. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass over now to Rutger. Thank you very much, Matt. So now we practice this, but I have to... Um, open my um, PowerPoint presentation, which hopefully um, I will manage. Um, this is work. Matt, could you tell me? Hold on. I can't see it yet. Oh. Um, but... uh, so... Just... How about now? It's coming now. It's here now. Wait Perfect. Okay, so in that case, uh, thank you so much for this introduction, Matt, uh, um, and for your kind words about my thesis. I should say that this is not, it's related to my thesis uh, uh, in terms of the topic, but um, it's not taken from my thesis. Um, it's actually a, a paper that I've co-authored, that I am co-authoring with uh, Bauke de Vries, from, uh, who's currently at Umea University in, in Sweden. Um, so, um, my talk today will be based on this paper, uh, and it is about the moral questions around the practice of uh, deporting um, those who hold uh, extremist convictions and who act on those convictions. So, um, as I think probably everyone is aware, uh, we don't have to go far into the past to find examples of this practice. In the last few days, um, in the wake of the beheading of a um, school teacher, after he had shown pupils uh, satirical cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, the French government has announced uh, its intention to deport um, 213 uh, foreigners who were on a government watch list and who are suspected of holding extreme uh, religious beliefs. Uh, and of course, many other Western democracies uh, have deported extremist Muslims and the so-called uh, hate imams. Uh, in the UK, um, I guess many will remember the uh, deportation of the radical cleric uh, Abu Qatada in 2013. 
Um, but it's not just extremist Muslims. Far-right extremists have also been uh, uh, regularly targeted by such deportations, including earlier this month um, when Ukraine deported two American citizens who um, belong to a neo-Nazi group, Atomwaffe Division, uh, for attempting to establish a local branch of this group and for trying to join a far-right Ukrainian military unit uh, to gain a combat experience. Uh, and a, UK, a recent UK example of a far-right deportation would be uh, the 2018 deportation of a German national, uh, Lutz Bachmann, who's the founder of uh, the uh, anti-Islam group Pegida, just before he was due to speak uh, alongside uh, EDL uh, leader, English Defence lead, uh, League leader, Tommy Robinson uh, at Speaker's Corner in, uh, in Hyde Park in London. Um, so the main question, yeah, there you go. The main question that uh, Bauke and I um, ask in this uh, paper is um, when, if ever, is deporting foreign nationals based on their extremist actions permissible, if not desirable or even required? So I should quickly note that we focus exclusively on uh, the deportation of foreign nationals and not of citizens uh, for the obvious reason that um, citizen deportation is impossible uh, under international law and also widely seen as categorically unacceptable. Uh, but of course, um, I should note that deporting a citizen does become possible once a state strips them of their citizenship. Um, and uh, this is a still relatively rare but still growing practice in liberal democracies and, and one that has actually been rediscovered precisely to counter uh, a perceived increase in extremism um, among dual nationals uh, in such countries. Uh, but other philosophers have, have defended this practice, um, notably uh, Christian Berry and Luara Ferraccioli have, have written an article on this. Um, uh, but, but this is really a discussion beyond the scope of this paper, even if it is connection, even, even, even if it is connected. Um, so the paper is structured in three parts and my talk will um, accordingly be structured in, in, in those three parts. So I'll begin by defining um, what we understand to be extremist acts. Uh, secondly, I will uh, make the case for deporting foreign extremists uh, by discussing the four uh, uh, beneficial functions uh, that they may serve. Um, and lastly, I'll discuss three objections to extremist deportations and, and give our response to these. So starting with the, with the, with the definition, um, to define extremist acts, it is first necessary to define extremist beliefs. Um, and we understand such beliefs to be convictions that are antithetical to fundamental liberal democratic values uh, and principles such as uh, the rule of law, civic equality, freedom of conscience, speech and association, uh, and rights to political participation. Um, so it is difficult to draw a very sharp boundary between extremist beliefs and non-extremist beliefs. Uh, but there are uh, clearly beliefs that fall unequivocally on the extremist side on which we focus. Um, and examples of this include beliefs that secular governments are by definition illegitimate and should be overthrown in favor of theocratic regimes, uh, belief, beliefs that women or members of specific ethnic minorities or religious minorities um, are naturally uh, inferior to others and should be accorded a lesser legal status, uh, and beliefs that it is morally um, permissible to use violence against uh, sexual minorities on grounds of their sexual orientation or, or gender identity. So extremist acts then are um, deeds that are motivated by such beliefs um, and paradigmatic examples of this include uh, attempts to overthrow a legitimate liberal democratic regime, uh, but also terrorist attacks um, and uh, racially motivated or homophobic uh, harassment and violence. And so we also include under extremist acts cases uh, where people deliberately facilitate or incite uh, others to engage in such acts. So think here of people um, who urge others to assault homosexuals or who deliver anti-Semitic or Islamophobic speeches uh, in public um, or when people seek to propagate uh, extremist ideologies by, by broadcasting such speeches on the internet and by sharing them on social media. So our claim is not that all such acts are um, equally um, uh, uh, weighty in their immorality, um, uh, but we do believe that um, even though those who engage in these activities, in these last activities I was talking about, they may not be personally involved in, for example, coups 
uh, against legitimate regimes or uh, in the use of violence against specific uh, minorities. Uh, but the fact that their actions can and not rarely do trigger such uh, first order extremist acts means that incitement of extremist acts may nonetheless have serious uh, consequences. Okay, so why think that uh, deporting non-nationals based on such extremist acts is ever justified? Um, so we believe that doing so may serve four important objectives. The first two are uh, protective in nature and the last two uh, communicative or symbolic. So the first is that um, deporting those who have engaged in extremist acts may promote the stability of liberal democracies. So this argument is predicated on the assumption um, that when large segments of society reject core liberal democratic values and principles, such regimes become imperiled. Um, and the clearest historical example of this arguably is provided by the spread of uh, anti-liberal democratic beliefs and sentiments uh, within Weimar Germany. Um, which contributed to its transformation into a fascist state during the 1920s and 30s. Now, of course, there's no guarantee that deporting non-citizen extremists will help to protect liberal democratic institutions once all the possible consequences of such deportations are taken into account. Um, for instance, um, they uh, uh, may actually serve to alienate and cause distrust among groups uh, whose religions or worldviews have similarities with those of the targeted extremists uh, without being extremists themselves. Uh, and that might risk a, a backlash whereby extremist views and dispositions are spread and reinforced to a greater degree than would have been the case had the deportation not taken place. Um, and also uh, uh, deported individuals may of course continue to undermine liberal democratic institutions uh, uh, of their former country of residence by maintaining contact with local extremists through the internet, for instance. Um, but even in cases where deporting foreign extremists has the, uh, 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 this effect, these effects, um, the positive effect that deporting these individuals has on the stability of a liberal democratic order may well outweigh them, or so we argue. Uh, especially when the deported has a significant political following or influence or special organizational, technical, or other types of skills um, and uh, when liberal democracies are relatively fragile because of political polarization or a lack of long-standing liberal democratic traditions, um, deportations can do a lot to protect these institutions given that being physically present in a country generally renders it easier for extremists to engage in subversive activities uh, because of the possibility of face-to-face -face, uh, interaction. And to go back to the Ukrainian, Ukrainian example here, um, there currently seems to be a genuine risk that Ukraine is fast becoming a fertile uh, training ground for white supremacist extremists from across the Western world. Um, and so deporting foreign extremists may well be a matter of, um, uh, of survival uh, for, the, for the Ukrainian state. Um, but in many countries, this is not likely to be the case. Um, but we argue that even when foreign extremists do not have the wherewithal to threaten the stability of, liberal, of the liberal democratic order as a whole, deporting them might still serve um, a valuable function, namely that of helping to protect the basic rights and liberties of citizens and, and remaining non-citizen residents, because those participating in or facilitating or inciting terrorist attacks and extremist violence often um, uh, they, do, they often do not belong to groups with a significant enough political influence to pose an existential threat to local liberal democratic institutions, but nonetheless, um, uh, they, by engaging in these activities, they clearly violate people's basic rights and liberties, including their right to life, uh, bodily integrity, security, freedom of association, freedom of speech. And by deporting this group, uh, the risk that they will engage in new and potentially more serious extremist acts within their current country of residence will be reduced. Um, especially when they are deported to a country from which uh, it is difficult to visit uh, their former country of residence. So another more indirect way in which not supporting foreign extremists uh, might undermine the enjoyment of uh, basic rights and liberties by citizens and uh, remaining foreign residents is that admitting to do so might in some circumstances be interpreted as um, evidence that the state endorses 
um, the extremist creeds of the non deported uh, or important aspects um, thereof. And that this will in turn embolden uh, them and other individuals with the same or comparable ideologies to commit more and possibly more serious extremist acts. So even if extremist deportations do not demonstrably come with either of these protective uh, benefits, um, we argue that they often still serve uh, a valuable uh, pedagogical function. So when states deport foreign extremists, they uh, signal to their citizens and the remaining non-citizen residents uh, what kind of behavior uh, is expected within a liberal democracy, or rather what kinds of behavior people ought to stay clear from. Um, now, of course, there are other ways of sending these messages, for instance, by introducing and enforcing strict anti-hate speech laws and um, through the public denouncement of extremist ideologies by state officials. Uh, but deportations also can be a powerful vehicle for this. For example, Bachmann's uh, deportation from the UK uh, was interpreted as such by a spokesperson for uh, Hope Not Hate, the anti-racism organization, uh, who compared it to earlier deportations of Islam, Islamist hate speeches, uh, 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 preachers, um, and avowing that the Home Office's decision to deport showed that, and I quote, these extremists are two sides of the same coin and they need each other, which we, the ordinary Britons, do not. So I should note that in order for deportations of foreign extremists to fulfill this pedagogical function, states of course need to let their citizens and residents know that they take place. Um, when extremists are deported in, street, in secrecy, as sometimes happens, such expulsions do not help governments to communicate their willingness to stand up for liberal democratic values and principles, even if they might still serve uh, the protective function uh, that I started with. And lastly, um, apart from educating citizens and residents about the importance of respecting fundamental uh, liberal democratic values um, and principles, um, extremist deportations can also help uh, reassure those uh, whose basic rights and liberties and equal standing as a citizen or resident um, are being challenged by extremists, uh, uh, that the state is committed to protecting their freedom and equality. Um, so for instance, deporting those who have committed hate crimes signals the state's willingness to stand up for the freedom and equality of marginalized communities in the face of extremist hatred directed towards them, whether it be Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, or homophobia. So offering such assurances um, we think is important because, first because it provides mental comfort to those who are being targeted by extremists, but also because uh, uh, lacking such assurances um, undermines people's ability to take advantage of their rights as they will be in considerable uncertainty over whether they can exercise them effectively or safely. As with the uh, civic education uh, objective, there are of course other ways than deporting non-nationals based on their extremist acts that help states to achieve the assurances, the reassurances objective. Um, such as imposing harsh punishments, punishments on those who incite hate crimes or engage in such, such crimes themselves. But still, in light of the symbolic significance that extremist deportations have for many, um, we, we argue that these, these exclusions are a very effective tool uh, for providing such assurances as well. So, despite these potential benefits of deporting extremists, we can also identify serious uh, risks associated with practice. And um, in the remainder of my talk, I, uh, I will discuss these uh, by addressing um, specifically three objections to this practice. Um, and while we, uh, we grant that each of these objections has some force, um, we end up concluding that uh, they fail to establish that extremist deportations of foreign residents or foreigners um, are categorically unjustified and so we try to show how this practice can and ought to be constrained uh, uh, in order to withstand uh, the objections. So the first objection is that uh, the power to deport foreign nationals when and because they've engaged in extremist act is vulnerable to abuse, to political abuse. And so the most uh, blatant form of abuse of this power is, would be when a government deports 
those whose presence or speech is uh, merely politically inconvenient um, by falsely painting them as extremists. Um, so that this is a real risk, um, I think, uh, uh, it can be seen from many examples, but maybe the best known historical example is um, uh, the fierce campaign in the early 20th century in the US, uh, in which the US government sought to identify and remove uh, quote unquote radical foreigners, uh, which uh, ended up with the expulsion of a wide range of politically active um, aliens, including not only communists and anarchists, but also labor organizers, Chinese anti-imperialists and foreign born black uh, activists. So some scholars uh, have identified echoes in, uh, uh, of, of this kind of abuse in the contemporary context, including in the um, summary expulsion of a large number of Muslim residents from the US in the immediate wake of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, um, as well as in those deportations of Islamic preachers from European countries that are often prompted by media stories that are based on secret intelligence that is not made public and um, uh, possibly on guilt by association. Um, so it does seem that um, the potential of abuse in case of deportation power is especially acute um, as uh, legal provisions uh, allowing for the deportation of extremists tend to have uh, vague and open-ended formulations uh, and thereby leave an unusual amount of discretion um, to the executive branch of government. So the legal standard that is used in the UK is a very good example of this um, because uh, foreign nationals can be deported from the UK whenever their presence is considered uh, not conducive to the public good by the Home Secretary, um, as many of you will, will obviously know. So it is of course very difficult, um, partly also due to the opacity around this practice, uh, to estimate uh, exactly how pervasive this type of blatant abuse where people are deported who should not be, uh, um, how pervasive it is. Um, but we, we note that even if it is not widespread, there may be another form of potential abuse, uh, namely when governments intentionally deport extremists of particular stripes, um, while uh, other extremists who engage in equally serious extremist acts and who are equally deportable are allowed to remain. And in this situation, of course, the individual deportations are not necessarily illegitimate and those targeted have engaged in properly extremist acts, uh, but still the, discri the discriminatory um, execution um, in this case renders the broader policy uh, illegitimate. Um, and uh, furthermore, um, even um, in the absence of the pervasive, use, pervasive abuse uh, of the blatant type um, that I started with, um, we can argue that the mere uh, potential for abuse and the opacity around the precise grounds for extremist deportation may make uh, foreign residents who of course already have fewer um, uh, avenues of political voice uh, available to them than their citizen co-residents within most societies. Uh, it may make them uh, hesitant to publicly voice their views or become politically active even when those views um, uh, fall within the bounds of what should be tolerated within a liberal democracy for fear uh, that any views, uh, that any of these views might be uh, controversial or misconstrued and, and thereby lead uh, to their expulsion. Um, so such self-censorship um, contains obvious costs for the foreign residents themselves by uh, decreasing the probability that their views and interests will be taken into account by those in power. But it also has costs for society at large um, because it can undermine the democratic legitimacy of its policies and um, uh, it may reduce uh, even the quality of political decision-making uh, if it is true as many have argued that a diversity of epistemic perspectives um, uh, is necessary to, to improve the quality of political decision-making. So these are real risks that uh, need to be taken seriously. Um, but we argue in the paper that such risks can um, and should uh, be minimized. And that this can be done uh, through the imposition of two restrictions on the power to deport 
extremist foreigners. So the first restriction is that deporting non-citizens based uh, on any extremist acts in which they have engaged is justified only when these acts are criminalized, uh, meaning that the relevant acts must be prescribed under law and that someone must be convicted by a criminal court uh, before they become eligible for deportation. Um, requiring a criminal conviction uh, not only raises the burden of proof that ought to be met and thus limits the interpretative discretion of the executive, it also gives people access to um, the more robust legal rights that the criminal justice system guarantees in order to minimize abuse of power, such as the right to legal counsel and a right to appeal. Um, and it also ensures that governments cannot punish non-citizens by deporting them for behavior that uh, is perfectly legal when engaged in by citizens. Now, uh, criminalization in this sense uh, does not mean that deportation would itself become part of the criminal procedure, um, uh, the criminal law procedure, um, because the deportation that follows from a court conviction is still issued not by the judicial branch, but by uh, the executive branch of government uh, and is not part of the court's uh, sentence for the offense. Um, and because a criminal conviction per se is, uh, uh, of course, no proof of extremism, deporting authorities must still make a convincing case that the crime committed is properly extremist. And therefore, our second proposed restriction is therefore that um, the criminal offenses that can lead to deportation on grounds of extremism um, uh, must be spelled out in a publicly available and exhaustive list of deportable offenses. So precisely what type of offenses will be on this list might vary between jurisdictions, um, but governments must be able to plausibly claim that the list of crimes are extremist in the sense uh, I talked about earlier. So codifying what kinds of extremist um, offenses are uh, one can be deported for uh, counters the risk that uh, the risks around abuse of use of deportation power, not only because it further limits the um, instances in which authorities can decide to deport, but also because the publicity of the procedure allows members of society to hold authorities accountable when they observe a discriminatory application of extremist deportation, uh, and because it reassures non-citizen residents uh, uh, who are hesitant to speak up or become politically active uh, by explicitly defining the boundaries of um, acceptable speech and behavior. So the se a second um, objection maintains that being deported is very costly for the deported, as well as for any of their loved ones who uh, remain within the society from which these people are deported, um, and therefore an inappropriate sanction, even for serious and criminalized offenses. Now, these costs obviously are greatest when uh, people are deported to illiberal or unstable um, countries where they might face um, severe destitution, persecution, torture, or even death. Um, but also when people are deported to countries where their basic rights are uh, not under threat, uh, they still may face heavy burdens as deporting someone from the place of residence um, uh, indefinitely severs their connections to people they share their life, they may share their life with there, which is not only burdensome for them, but also, but also for those people, um, and to the life projects that they were pursuing there. Um, and it's interesting here to, to, to uh, contrast expulsion to, um, uh, to incarceration, uh, uh, because expulsion is of course not aimed at rehabilitation. Um, and we see this especially uh, in the case of deportations on the grounds of extremism, which are generally paired with lengthy re-entry bans and in some cases even life bans. So again, um, my co-author and I agree that there are serious, that these are serious considerations to take into account, but we disagree that they invariably render deportation uh, illegitimate. Rather, we propose a proper uh, proportionality test uh, uh, needs to take place before such deportations can be ordered. Um, uh, uh, that would need to weigh the costs of any deportation to the would-be deportee, deportee and their uh, uh, loved ones against the threat they pose to liberal democratic institutions and the enjoyment of basic rights and liberties. 
And when these costs are proportional to the severity of the act, um, we believe deportation is permissible. So quickly, it should be clear that a substantial risk of death or torture or persecution in the destination country is a disproportionate cost that can never be imposed, even on the most serious offenders. Um, but I would note that uh, even if it is not always respected in practice, the principle of non refoulement is well established in international law and, 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 and already forbids deportations in such cases. Um, more uh, or less clearly, maybe, um, we also believe that long term and permanent residents. Um, should be given serious weight in such a proportionality test. And this would suggest that um, while deportations of those who have only recently settled on a territory or, uh, or are only visiting are permissible for less serious extremist offenses, uh, once residents pass a threshold at which they can be said to be a permanent long-term resident, say around uh, five years, deportation um, would only be permissible for the most serious of extremist offenses, namely when they pose a serious and imminent threat to their society of residence. Uh, and even with this threshold in place, of course, some shorter term residents who have strong family ties, especially parents of minor children, uh, we believe should enjoy a fairly strong protections. Um, so a third objection maintains that deporting foreign residents who've committed extremist offenses is uh, unfair um, to their countries of citizenship, uh, which are required under international law to uh, accept them back. So in this view, transferring residents that cause problems in one society to another society uh, where they uh, regularly cause similar, if not worse problems, um, amounts to a shirking of the deporting state's responsibility to rehabilitate those who committed offenses uh, on its territory. Again, uh, we believe that this is an objection that has force in certain circumstances, uh, but only when the deporting state actually has a greater responsibility for the extremist individual in question than the, um, than the, 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 the state of citizenship. So, um, this is obviously not the case um, when um, countries of citizenship have actively contributed to their expatriate citizens' extremist acts abroad or simply negligently fail to prevent them, for example, by withholding intelligence about a planned terrorist attack. Um, and uh, we argue that in such cases, deportation is not only uh, not unfair towards those countries, but arguably an appropriate way of holding the receiving states accountable for its moral failure, failures. Uh, and the same is true, we believe, when such states have contributed to the radicalization of their citizens abroad or negligently fail to prevent them from adopting extremist views, for example, by allowing extremist preachers uh, to propagate their extremist views in public in, in, in those countries. Um, and it, it's maybe good to mention that even in such cases where expat citizens were radicalized in their country of residence rather than their country of citizenship, um, their radicalization may in some cases still have been influenced heavily by the agents of the country, the agents of the country of citizenship. But of course, um, the opposite also holds. Uh, when the country of current residents can be said to be responsible for the radicaliza radicalization of a given resident through complicity or negligence, this would make it unfair indeed to send the individual back to her country of citizenship. Um, and we think that when the extremists have spent a significant part of their childhood in the country of residence, um, Negligence, negligence can generally be assumed um, uh, on the part of the deporting state um, because these are years in which states can exert a large influence on the development of someone's uh, political views and, and dispositions through the educational system. So expelling those who came as children or others who spend a very long time living in their country of residence back to a country of nationality where they may have few or no remaining links um, also seems unfair to that country when the country of residence has made the path to citizenship uh, unduly difficult because these people uh, would not be eligible for deportation had the deporting state acted justly and allowed them to naturalize. So for instance, Italy um, has used deportation of extremists on a much larger scale than many other European countries um, and does this almost exclusively in relation to, to Islamist extremists 
Um, but this is very much facilitated by its extremely restrictive citizenship laws, which have unjustly, in our view, left uh, most second generation immigrants without Italian nationality and therefore vulnerable to deportation. So there's one more situation in which insisting on a receiving state's formal responsibility to take their extremist national back is in our eyes inappropriate. And that is when the cumulative effect of deporting extremists risks undermining the stability or the security of the receiving country. So for instance, uh, the deportations of Afghan nationals from many European countries that have resumed in recent years um, already seem to have provided a steady, steady stream of recruits for the Taliban, as many of these individuals are young single males who struggle to find employment or housing even upon arrival. And um, strengthening the Taliban in this way is, is undermining the already fragile position of the elected and, and internationally backed Afghani government. And for our argument, it's important to note that when these individuals already hold extremist views um, and have proven willing to act upon these views before they are deported uh, to Afghanistan, um, the risk that they will help destabilize this country um, is even more acute. So in order to avoid such out outcomes, we take it that um, when would-be deporting states are better able to address the risks posed by foreign extremists within their societies than the countries of citizenship um, um, are in a position to, um, the foreign extremists it, uh, 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 would be if the foreign extremists were sent there, um, deporting uh, these individuals will be morally uh, impermissible. So to conclude, um, our argument is that um, while deporting extremists can serve valuable uh, protective and communicative purposes. Um, we have argued that we argue that it, uh, 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 deporting foreign nationals based on their extremist acts is morally justifiable if and only if um, they've been found guilty by a criminal court of at least uh, one of an, exhaust an exhaustive and public list of deportable extremist offenses. Um, if the costs that are imposed upon the deportee and possible loved ones are proportional to the protective and communicative functions served by such deportations, um, and um, if fairness towards the receiving countries has been uh, ensured. Um, so, um, by way of conclusion, I want to stress that this qualified defense of deporting foreign extremists um, should not be taken as a justification of existing deportation regimes in most countries as um, the, the, the open-ended formulations of legal provisions uh, that currently allow many liberal democracies to, to order the expulsion um, of supposed radicals um, fail to satisfy our, uh, our conditions. So, by way of conclusion. Thank you. Thanks very much, Radka.